This is The Chris Berry Show. Expert information on wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. Information that you can understand. Here's your host, Chris Berry. Welcome to the show. This week, just like every week, we're going to start with a positive focus. So something positive that happened the previous week, either personally or professionally. And uh, this past weekend, I uh, took uh, my wife and kids. We went to the uh, Ann Arbor Symphony. Uh, so it was great to go there. Uh, my kids are huge Star Wars fans, so the Ann Arbor Symphony uh, was playing the music from Star Wars uh, with uh, the ninth uh, uh, episode of the uh, three-part trilogy coming up, coming out in December. Uh, so Star Wars is a big thing. And uh, it was great. It was great to go to. Uh, we haven't been to the Michigan Theater. I can't remember the last time I've been there, uh, but I haven't been there with my kids, that's for sure. Uh, and it was uh, 8 o'clock at night, and we were walking around downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, and it was great walking around with the little ones. My kids are 6 and 9. Uh, my son, uh, Ryan, is 9. My daughter, Madison, is 6. Uh, and uh, th- they really enjoyed it. Uh, they both fell asleep, which was uh, kind of funny. Uh, but it was past their bedtime. Usually we go to bed pretty early. So they're were, they were out late. It was a late night for them. But uh, the part that they're awake for, they, they certainly enjoyed it. And they said they'd go back. Uh, but it was great. Uh, it was great to go to the Ann Arbor uh, Symphony. We've been down to Detroit. Uh, Ann Arbor is obviously a little bit of a closer drive. Uh, smaller venue, easier to get out of there. Uh, but it was great. It was great to uh, do that. So that was my positive focus. And this week I'm very excited because I'm going to have, and this is the first time we've done this, one of our own team members. So we're going to have Ashley Jacobson. Uh, She's an attorney with our firm on the legal side. Uh, And she's going to talk about uh, something that makes her a little bit unique, uh, her background of working with people with disabilities. Uh, And it was one of the reasons we were so excited to bring her on as part of the team. And and some of you, uh, if you are one of our uh, clients uh, or you've attended one of our workshops, you might have met Ashley. Uh, But she's just a great addition to the team. And uh, uh, it's one of those things where I've been practicing for over 15 years, but just with her unique background, uh, I'm learning things from her. So it's it's great. She's a great addition to our team, and she's a great addition to our team uh, also to really benefit our clients uh, because she does have this unique background uh, with individuals with disabilities. And I don't want to steal her thunder, but uh, make sure to join us uh, in our second and third segments of the show today uh, as we get into a conversation with Ashley, uh, her unique, unique background with disabilities and why it's so important uh, to uh, have this background with the type of work that we're doing. Now, in our first segment, what I'm going to do is, what I want to do is uh, just talk about, as I was at the symphony uh, with my kids and, and my wife, I was just thinking about that's kind of the role that, that we serve for our clients. Uh, I was watching the conductor, and the conductor, he was the one up there, uh, not necessarily playing any instruments or anything like that, but he was really uh, leading uh, the symphony. And so we arrived a little bit early, and we're listening as the individuals were kind of tuning their uh, violins or uh, the oboe or French horn and the harp and the piano, uh, and they're just kind of doing their own thing. And uh, what I find is for a lot of people as they're moving into the second half of life, uh, it's kind of similar in the sense of they might have a legal uh, plan over here and a, a financial plan over here and an investment plan uh, and maybe a tax plan. And maybe they hire some professionals to, to fill these different roles. But there's not really necessarily a conductor making sure that all the pieces fit together properly, that all the music plays together correctly. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of our clients uh, like to work with us is because we can take care of what we think of as the five areas of any retirement plan. Uh, so when you're planning for the second half of life, uh, we can help people with uh, five specific areas where we can help them with creating an income plan, an investment plan, a health plan, a tax plan, and a legacy plan, all under one roof. 
So think of it as a conductor where we're putting together all the pieces of this retirement where uh, the three main kind of professionals that, that people work with, a uh, uh, legal, uh, financial, and tax professional, uh, with the team that we've assembled, uh, we're able to help clients with the legal planning, with the financial planning, with uh, the tax planning, either uh, uh, through myself, one of our team members, or, or affiliated professional. So at the end of the day, uh, you don't have the French horn playing uh, its own thing. You don't have the violinist uh, playing his or her own thing. Uh, the the harp and the piano, it's going to their own tune. You have a conductor. And this comes into play in so many different ways. So with my background, I started off just as an attorney doing estate planning, uh, but very quickly uh, our clients were approaching us to take on kind of more and more work where uh, they wanted more solutions from us other than just legal solutions. And so that's why we've really created this these five different areas. So having an income plan, uh, having an investment plan, having a tax plan, having a health care plan, and having a, a legacy plan. So with that income plan, the things that are important to think about is when you move into retirement, all of a sudden your wages are going to go away. And so how are you going to cover your expenses in retirement? You might have Social Security and you might have a pension. And one of the things we do is we run a lot of Social Security optimization reports for clients, uh, trying to maximize the amount of income uh, they can get from Social Security. So we think this is, is the foundation of any retirement plan is to have that income plan in retirement. And we like to break that income plan into really three buckets, because what we're going to have to do is utilize assets typically to cover that income gap. Because typically, Social Security only makes up about 40% of an individual's retirement income. Uh, and we need to figure out where is the other 60% going to come from. And typically, that comes from assets. So we need to organize those assets, all that wealth that you've accumulated into three buckets. And typically, we'll have a now bucket, which is money we're going to need over the next year, a soon bucket, uh, money we need from maybe now until the time we claim Social Security, uh, and then a later bucket, money that we're going to use later. And that money should be invested differently based on that time horizon. But by breaking up our assets into these three buckets, it helps us develop an income plan. Uh, for example, uh, working with some clients right now, they're about uh, two years, maybe three years away from retirement. And they've stocked away a lot of money in their 401k, but they're concerned about where the market's going. And so what we're going to do is instead of having all their money invested in that later bucket that's just geared towards growth, uh, because the, along with growth, you also might get uh, the inverse of that, uh, losses and risk, uh, we're going to take a portion of their assets and uh, put it into an investment vehicle that will be safe, uh, can still get, have some growth. Uh, but also will cover their income needs for the next 10 years, understanding that uh, they're about three years from retirement and they don't want to lose all this money they've accumulated now uh, just because the market takes a downturn. So uh, by utilizing this bucket planning strategy for their income of figuring out how much money they need now, how much money they'll need in the future, uh, and then once they trigger Social Security, then the rest of their assets can go into that later bucket. Now we have an income plan where we've guaranteed their income for the next 10 years of their life so that the rest of the money they have invested in the market, that later bucket, can continue to grow. And if the market goes down, they're not concerned because they have a time horizon. So once that income plan is developed, then the next step is developing that asset plan or that investment plan. So the other assets not geared towards income, how are we going to invest those in such a way uh, that you're beating inflation, but uh, you're taking on only as, uh, as much risk as you're willing to take on? And that's part of developing that investment plan. And that's where we work with clients to figure out how much volatility they're willing to take on. Uh, and then from there, putting together an investment portfolio that matches their volatility tolerance. So again, it's just about having a plan and making sure this plan is in sync with all the different pieces. Making sure that if you look at this as an orchestra, all the pieces of the puzzle, uh, all the musicians are playing together uh, so that we have one unified plan.
And then the third piece of that is a tax plan. And this is very important these days because right now with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, taxes are on sale. So if you're not engaging in any type of tax planning, and I'm not talking about tax preparation looking in the past. What I'm talking about is tax planning, looking to the future. How are you going to handle taxes, especially if you have IRAs and 401ks and 403bs, especially if you have have a lot of these pre-tax accounts, uh, how are you going to navigate that for the next five to 10 years? So that's something we work with our clients is creating a tax map of how are we going to manage taxes for the next five to 10 years? Because right now there's opportunity because right now taxes are on sale. And I say that because right now, uh, if you're in, let's say, the 12% tax bracket in 2025, that's jumping up to uh, 15%. Or if you're at 22, it's jumping up to 25%. Uh, So if you pay the taxes sooner rather than later, you might save 3 to 4% on taxes, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, it can make a dramatic effect. And Plus, at the end of the day, I'd, I'd rather uh, spend my money than let the government spend my money. So having that tax plan is the third piece of that uh, retirement game plan, uh, of third piece of, of having an orchestra that's playing that unified music, that beautiful song. And then the third or the fourth piece of it is having a health care plan. And this is not only a plan for how you're going to cover your health care costs in retirement, so prescription costs and looking at what is the best Medicare plan. Also, it's talking about long-term care planning as well. So uh, if you're to be diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's or uh, if you were to develop a disability, and that's one of the things that Ashley Jacobson will talk about in our second and third segments, uh, is how disability planning is an important piece of any any plan. Uh, so even if you don't have a loved one who has, disabil- has disabilities now or you don't have any disabilities, it's still something that should be incorporated into your planning uh, because we are living longer than ever and, and you never know when things might happen. So that fourth piece is to have that health care plan in place. And then the fifth piece, uh, and the fifth uh, kind of musician uh, in terms of creating uh, that uh, retirement music would be having that legacy plan. So uh, for uh, any assets that you are going to leave to maybe the kids, the next generation, your beneficiaries, how can we leave them those assets in such a way that they're protected, uh, protected from things like divorces or lawsuits or long-term care, or protected so that if one of your uh, children were to pass away, their share doesn't go to the spouse, the in-law, uh, but continues to, to stay in the bloodline. Uh, or let's look at those retirement accounts. How are you going to leave those retirement accounts to the next generation? Uh, are you going to leave it to them outright where you've named your kids as the beneficiaries? Well, this could be a problem for two reasons. One could be the financial maturity of your beneficiaries. Uh, so, for example, my kids are nine and six right now, and if I were to pass away and they inherited all my money, they're going to spend all that money on Legos and stuffed animals, which uh, I think would be kind of fun, but is probably not the best use of that money. Now, what we'll do is we'll assume that all of your children make great financial choices. Because keep in mind, once you turn 18, legally you're an adult. Uh, and I'm young enough to remember what I was doing 18 to 25. And if I inherited 5,000, 50,000, or 500,000, could have been the coolest kid on campus, but that might have been my only year on campus, right? So financial maturity is the first thing that uh, we should be concerned about when we're talking about legacy planning. Uh, and then the second thing and the bigger issue is not the financial maturity, but life throwing you a curveball or throwing one of your beneficiaries a curveball. So let's say you named one of your children as a beneficiary of that IRA, and then uh, after you pass away, then they pass away. Well, now that money might go to an in-law who we call an outlaw versus going down to your potential grandchildren. Uh, and this is something that we see all the time. It's, it's so important. It, uh, people are just leaving things outright to the kids or beneficiaries with the idea that, oh, they have a good head on their shoulder. But unfortunately, what we see is life throws people curveballs. For example, one of the things I'm sure Ashley will talk about will be, uh, what if you're in a car accident and have like a a brain injury? I've sat down with clients who've had brain injuries. It's not something they planned on, uh, but you need to make sure that with your financial planning, with your legal planning, 
try to take care of these things ahead of time. Because understand that, that not everyone and hardly anyone has that that average stereotypical life of, what is it, two and a half kids in a white picket fence. That That's not available to everyone. Life's going to throw you curveballs. And so through legal planning and financial planning and tax planning and income planning, investment planning and legacy planning, there's steps we can do to try to build in protections. Now, I'm not trying to be like a, a doomsday person or anything out there, and, and I'm not a jinx uh, hoping these things happen to individuals or families, but in my 15 years, it's something that I see. Uh, I can think in this uh, past year, I've probably sat down with at least three to five, if not more, families who uh, at least one of the individuals were in a car accident have has either a, a, a concussion symptom still or or uh, a brain ongoing brain injury from it. So it is something that can happen. Life can throw you a curveball at any time. And so by having your legal planning, your tax planning, uh, your financial planning uh, all put together, you can try to protect against these things as, as much as possible. So uh, again, I was just reminded of, of the type of work that we do at our firm. Really, it's like a composer trying to, to make sweet music with your retirement, uh, with the idea that we don't want kind of individual musicians going off on their own. Uh, this all should be uh, put together in an orchestrated way uh, so that all the pieces of the puzzle fit together, that all the music sounds great, so that your legal plan, your financial plan, your tax plan, they're all speaking to each other. They're all supporting each other. And so if you want to learn more, take the next step. Uh, we do workshops about once a week at one of our different locations. Uh, and we have some workshops coming up in Livonia, Brighton. Uh, and then in December, we have a financial workshop coming up in Howell. But if you want some more information on our workshops, give us a call at 810-355-2584 or visit us on the web at thechrisberryshow.com. And stick with us as uh, we bring in Ashley Jacobs as she talks about disability planning. If you're looking for guidance in estate planning, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the elder care firm in Brighton, like Brian Measle and his family did. For quite a long time, I worked on my parents trying to get them to establish an estate plan or a will or a trust, and they had absolutely nothing in place. We had set a, a first initial meeting with Chris on a Monday with him, and that Friday afternoon, my, my mom had passed away, and we had nothing in place. So... We kept our meeting, obviously with a heavy heart, and Chris made us feel very comfortable and assured. My dad is a person who doesn't care for politicians or attorneys, <laughs> and he really likes Chris. Thought it was a fantastic fit for us and, and our, our circumstance. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit TheElderCareFirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. So welcome, Ashley Jacobson. Very excited to have you on the show, one of our new attorneys here at the firm. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Sure. So obviously I know uh, quite a bit about you, but uh, why don't you tell our listeners uh, what led you to becoming an attorney in the first place? Well, my journey to becoming an attorney is a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. I actually started off in a totally different career. Um, but the way I became an attorney makes a lot of sense to my background. Mm -hmm. So I, many people might not know this about me, but I am very passionate about advocating for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, those close to me will know that. <laughs> but I really got into that arena because my sister was in a pretty severe car accident mm -hmm. when she was 16. Mm -hmm. From there, I was pre-law at Michigan State at the time. I was 19. And, you know, seeing her go through that opened up my world to this realm of serving people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, I was able to see her strength 
and her perseverance and also all of the resources available to people as they age and acquire disability. Mm -hmm. So I went into special education. I became a special educator. And then I saw a need for people with disabilities having long-term planning, things mm -hmm. with careers and money management and all those things that aren't really taught currently in special education programs. So I got my master's degree in rehabilitation counseling. Mm -hmm. And it's not substance abuse counseling, although the name kind of sounds sure. like that. Um, it's actually counseling individuals <laughs> as they acquire disability. Mm -hmm. So you teach them things like independent living skills, mm -hmm. money management, um, how to be self-determinative and advocate for themselves as they age. And in my time as a therapist, I actually had many clients dealing with legal issues. Mm. I had one client in particular who inspired me to go to law school. She called the police for help, and because of her communication disorder, when they arrived, they arrested her oh, because goodness. they misunderstood the situation. Ugh. Which was horrible, and yeah. it was difficult for her to go through. She had no prior issues with the police or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it made me really investigate the way people with disabilities navigate our legal system mm -hmm. because people with disabilities are dealing with the same issues as everybody else, things like losing and planning for financial stability mm -hmm. and planning for their families and going through divorces and I'm dealing with getting speeding tickets and all of those things, <laughs> sure. you know, and I realized that when I was trying to refer my clients, my counseling clients mm -hmm. to an attorney, the attorneys didn't have a really well-versed knowledge on disability issues and how people with disabilities might need different approaches mm -hmm. to any legal issue. And so I decided to go to law school and did that, and I'm here, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, okay. And that's great, and we're, it's great to have you here. And so your, your background, like you mentioned, it is a little bit unique in that you have these different certifications, right? So in addition yes. to your law degree, which we call a, a Juris Doctorate, so you have a JD after right. your name, and then now you're an Esquire once you pass the bar. Yes. Uh, what other certifications do you have? Well, I prior to law school and in mm -hmm. graduate school, I got my CRC, which means I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor, mm -hmm. which makes me uniquely qualified to assess the needs of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Everything from how can I make sure they're understanding this document cognitively? Sure. How can I make sure they can sign this document physically? Mm -hmm. And how can I assess their needs based on disability and all of the other factors in their lives as they age? Yeah, and with kind of that background, it, it's a perfect mix of what we're doing in terms of helping people plan for the second half of life because uh, these are things that are happening basically daily where you're sitting down with people and maybe there's dementia or some type of disability uh, that they're dealing with. And, and having that unique background really is, is, is an advantage, I would say. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, so what are, I guess, some of the common disabilities you worked with previously? And, and then the follow-up question I'll have for you is, is what are some of the ones that people deal with as they age? So first, my specialty initially started working with people with traumatic brain injury. Okay. And that also included people with other types of brain injuries, stroke, mm -hmm. and even some dementia and memory loss. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of background in working with people with memory loss that's either getting progressively worse or will stay the same as they age. Mm -hmm. My teaching certification was in cognitive impairments. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of background working with people on the autism spectrum as well, and also those with physical disability from chronic health conditions, things like arthritis, cancer, and other illnesses that you might see in the aging population, things like Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And then as people age, many people might not know that you really should plan for having some type of disability as you get older. Mm -hmm. I always like to say that if you're given the opportunity to age, you will have a disability at some point, whether it's psychiatric, maybe you go through a really tough time, and you're dealing with depression or anxiety mm -hmm. or cognitive impairment, you get into a car accident, and physical impairment like a chronic illness. 
Many people don't know that the elderly population is one of the largest populations among the disability community. Mm -hmm. They tend to deal with things like visual impairments, losing their eyesight, dealing with things like macular degeneration and cataracts. Mm -hmm. And they also deal with their body slowing down and acquiring things like arthritis Mm -hmm. and other illnesses that they either had for a while, but they didn't notice it until they're older, or mm-hmm. they acquire it as they age, things like you mentioned, dementia sure. and Alzheimer's. Yeah. The elderly population between the ages of 65 and 74, mm-hmm. there's around a 20% portion of those individuals that have a disability. Hmm. When you get to 75 plus, mm-hmm. that more than doubles. So you're actually at a 49% of people Mm -hmm. age 75 and up have a disability. Mm. So the main things that you see with clients as they age disability wise are things like dealing with physical changes, maybe mobility impairments, Mm -hmm. not being able to cook like they used to, Mm -hmm. be able to drive a visual impairment, and also other illnesses that become more readily apparent as they age, things like Parkinson's, ALS, and dementia. Sure. And and maybe this is a a basic question or just talking about language, but it seems like right now language is very important. What what defines a disability? I'm glad that you asked that because there is a lot of misperceptions out there about that term. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believe that you don't have a quote unquote disability if you're not on social security disability benefits. Mm And that's just not the case. And because many people believe that, they don't know that there are options and resources and rights available to them Mm -hmm. if they're not on those benefits. So the term disability itself is broad, but under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's a person who either has a physical, mental, cognitive, psychiatric, or other disability, Mm -hmm. a person who has been diagnosed with such disability, Mm -hmm. or a person who's regarded as having a disability. So if people reasonably believe that you have a disability, even if you're not formally diagnosed, you have a right to receive certain resources and services. Mm -hmm. And that definition is much larger than the term legally disabled under SSDI, social security disability. Yeah, yeah. because as you're talking, I was thinking, well, disability, depending on how you use the phrase or or the word, can mean a lot of different things. Because even uh, as we're talking about aging, I'm thinking about even my own self. Like Mm -hmm. there's some things that now at age 40 that I'm having troubles doing that I could have done it at 20. Now, a lot of those things are silly and like athletic and I shouldn't be doing them maybe this <laughs> as much as I did in the first place. But um, it, it's just like, at what point would that be con- like, where's the line of this is a disability versus not a disability? Maybe there isn't mm-hmm. a line there. So when you have a physical, mental, cognitive or visual or mm-hmm. any other type of disability, hearing disability, and that seriously impacts one or more major life functions, Mm -hmm. then that is meeting the category under that first category in the ADA definition of disability. Mm, So maybe you are limited in your ability to dress like you used to, to button Mm -hmm. your shirts like you used to, to put on a tie like you used to, um, or to cook or to drive. And so those would all be indicators that you have a disability. But again, even if you aren't seriously impaired in one or more major life functions, you can still be deemed as having a disability if you've been diagnosed with any type of illness or disability, Mm -hmm. or if you're regarded by others as having a disability. So you used some words, um, major life function. Mm -hmm. Is that a a defined term then when we're talking about disabilities? Because we have activities of daily living, and there's six major activities of daily living. One is, and I like to say the first six things Mm -hmm. we do in the morning, uh, transition out of bed, get dressed, uh, go to the bathroom, uh, prepare a meal, take our meds, uh, take a shower. And so those are defined as right. our activities of daily living. Major life functions, is, is that similar or is that more broad? It's similar, but it, it is broader. So activities of daily living are encompassed in the major life function mm. category. Okay. But a major life function could also be maybe you're not able to sleep well at night. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, maybe you're having difficulty communicating. Mm. So it's not only the ways in which your disability affects your environment and the tasks that you're able to do, it also is in the way that your disability manifests itself in your body and your mind. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. So now that we kind of have a, a firmer grasp around what a disability is, um, what uh, disability considerations should be assessed and analyzed in legal and financial planning for one's future. You said this is important. So what are, what are the things that we should be looking for? It's very important. On the legal side, you want to make sure that you're planning for the future that you might not want to think about, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people, and I'm sure you've seen this a lot as well, they, they come in and they say, well, I don't need a power of attorney because I'm really healthy right now. <laughs> and what I've heard you say sometimes is, well, if we can look into a crystal ball and predict the future, I will plan exactly for that future. But unfortunately, we can't. Right. And so my main focus legally for people as they acquire disability, if they haven't yet, is to keep an open mind that this could be a part of your future. It doesn't mean that your life is over. You can have a very fulfilling and meaningful mm. life with disability, but you should plan for that, especially if perhaps you know that certain disabilities run in your family mm -hmm. or you're starting to notice things in physical or mental decline. It's important to not ignore those and to make plans for as you age for things like long-term care. Mm -hmm. Is your home environment accessible to you if you have a disability that's progressive? Mm -hmm. If you need to use a cane, a walker, or a wheelchair, are you able to get in and out of your home, the nursing home, wherever you're living, your family's home, if they're going to be your caretaker, you wanna make sure that your home environment is accessible. And legally, that has implications. You wanna make sure that as you age legally, you have a plan in place for if you have a disability, being able to explain to an attorney or a financial planner really mm -hmm. what your goals are mm -hmm. and what the current issues are that you're facing. I'm seeing a lot of lawyers and financial planners elsewhere that they meet with a client with a disability in the exact same way that they would meet with a client without a disability. And for the most part, that might be okay. But there is a need to individualize the services, which is really what we do here, mm -hmm. because when you sit down with a person who's had a stroke and maybe is having a word recall issue where they're trying to say one word, but they can't, but they can think it. Mm -hmm. And I deal with this a lot with brain injury mm -hmm. clients as well. My sister went through this. You have to know to ask the right questions and to be able to identify as the attorney or the financial planner, and also if, if you're the client yourself, you need to say, I'm having trouble saying what I mean to say. Can you ask me this in a different way? Mm -hmm. And a lot of lawyers, if they get an answer that maybe isn't sufficient, they might just blow past it, mm -hmm. or they might hand the same size font document to somebody with a visual impairment mm -hmm. as they would to somebody without. And when you do those things, you're really limiting the person with a disability's ability to actively participate in their legal and financial planning. And to me, as a disability advocate and as an attorney, that's not okay. Right. People with disabilities are just as equipped to make financial and legal decisions as long as they know when and how to ask the questions they need to ask. And the attorney and the financial planner know the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And... In, in what what I'm hearing is that really treating the person as an individual in that um, looking at crystal ball, we never know what's going to happen. You mentioned getting in a car accident. Just last week, I sat down with a woman who was in a car accident and um, and she a couple of years ago, and it's still affecting her mentally. And mm -hmm. it was something that she brought up mm -hmm. as part of our meeting. And and so these are things that we don't necessarily plan for, but we should have at least some type of plan in place. And uh, stick with us as we continue this conversation with Ashley, maybe talking about some of the tools that we can utilize to make sure that we have our legal financial affairs in order. Because you never know when life's going to throw you a curveball. So we need to make sure we have that plan in place ahead of time. So join us as we continue the conversation with Ashley Jacobson.
If you or a loved one is in need of estate planning, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the elder care firm, like Dave Marsh did from Pinckney. You hear stuff about attorneys being, you know, crooks and whatever, you know. I didn't know if I could find one that wasn't going to try and, you know, stiff me. So I was really happy to find the elder care firm. They were just really, really helpful. I I went to that seminar, and when I would call people, I'd get calls back. They'd answer questions, and it's just I was real happy with it all. They laid out everything was going to cost me, and, you know, it gave me a, a real good peace of mind. I would recommend them to anybody, you know. And I don't recommend a lot of people, you know, but I would recommend them. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. I can help you develop the best plan possible. Call 810-214-3800 to schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation or to reserve your seat at our next workshop. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. All right, welcome back. So we're continuing the conversation with Ashley Jacobson, a new attorney at the firm, and we're talking about her background and experience and certifications helping people with disabilities. So we're talking about legal and financial planning for the idea that we may experience a, a disability or some type of event where uh, we might need the assistance of others in the future. And so what are some tools someone could utilize to make sure that they've kind of set things in place ahead of time? So the main tools when it comes to legal and financial planning Mm -hmm. for people with disabilities would be what we like to call disability documents. So there's the financial power of attorney Mm -hmm. where the client would dictate an agent to assist them with finances Mm -hmm. and manage their accounts as they age and have disabilities or just don't want to deal with that on their own anymore. Mm -hmm. There's the medical power of attorney, which is more detailed than a health directive that you might get from a hospital or doctor's office. So that gives you options not just for life-sustaining or end-of-life treatment or care, but also gives you the opportunity to share medical information with certain individuals, give decision-making power outside of -of end-of-life care to individuals that you really trust. Mm -hmm. And that would come into place when you are unable to make health decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's also the personal care plan, which is something that I would love to see used more by more law offices, Mm -hmm. but I haven't seen that a lot, but it's really effective and it personalizes the planning process for the client and for a person with a disability who perhaps is accustomed to people Mm -hmm. taking away their autonomy and their decision-making power, the personal care plan is a great tool to be used to say, this is my favorite food. I love pizza. When I go into a long-term nursing home, I want pizza once a week. (laughs) Or to say, I want to go to the park every other day. And these things are important because as you age, you don't lose your interests and the things that you really like or the things you really hate. So maybe you don't want to be served broccoli in the nursing home. Mm -hmm. And so that decision-making power can be broad for the the power of attorneys that step into that role. And so the personal care plan really helps dictate your wishes Mm -hmm. for that long-term care treatment. Yeah. And I think Really, you hit the nail on the head of what we're doing here is planning for the second half of life with the understanding that people typically don't just go from healthy to passing away these days. And Mm -hmm. with this additional longevity, uh, more and more people are through the frailties of aging or Alzheimer's or now even car accidents. A a number of clients I've sat down with have been involved in a car accident, had some type of brain injury, and they're just not functioning the same way they did before. Right. And like you said earlier, it's we don't know when something like that's going to happen. If you can tell us exactly when you're going to get in a car accident and the day before, we'll make sure we have these disability documents in place. But, right. Uh, unless uh, that crystal ball, ball is working, then we're really not going to know. So let me ask you this. Uh, what do you wish people understood about people with disabilities? The main thing that I wish people understood is that people with disabilities are people above anything else. Mm -hmm. And that might seem really simple, but I frequently see 
even well-meaning family members and friends kind of assume that the person with a disability won't want to do things like have romantic relationships, Mm -hmm. manage their money, or maybe they Mm -hmm. assume they they won't make as much money, which is a false assumption. There are many people with disabilities working part-time and full-time. And and so that's not just happening with children with disabilities. Right. As people age and acquire disability, their family members, in a well-meaning way, step in and they want to help. But you want to make sure that the person with a disability has self-determination at the forefront. So that means they have the power to make decisions that are based on their best interests Mm -hmm. and their wishes. And so even if you have a loved one with a disability or if you don't, or maybe you are a person with a disability yourself, it's most important to know that you are still the individual you were before Mm -hmm. and you have the same opportunities as anybody else to carve the life that you want. Mm And so if we can focus on putting the person first above their disability, sure, disability comes into play in many different conversations where it's very relevant, things like accessibility and understanding legal rights. But we want to make sure that we're not treating people with disabilities like these other beings Mm -hmm. because they're people and you might think that you can't relate to their experience until you do. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's kind of this idea, and we've talked a little bit about it, the idea of like boxing someone into a label, right? right? Where uh, as long as you're coming from the standpoint of everyone's an individual and not they're a person, not they're not defined by maybe their diagnosis or whatever their disability is. It's not just, right. oh, that's someone that has dementia or that's Alice. Right. Right. Alice is a person and Alice has wishes. And that also comes into play with invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. And those are things like chronic illness, mental illness, even sometimes visual impairment Mm -hmm. and and things like that brain injury, where oftentimes people will not, if they have a family member with that disability, they might not recognize that legal and financial planning might be necessary Mm -hmm. as that person ages. And so just because in your mind, you might, a lot of people have the picture of a person with a disability as in a wheelchair. That's kind of this historical image that's used in accessibility parking signs (laughs) and on bathrooms. Even our parking lot, I was going to say, yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But people with with disabilities might have a disability that's completely not noticeable Mm. to you Mm -hmm. or to a stranger. So again, that's why it's important to individualize based on every person's needs, Mm -hmm. not to assume one person with one type of disability is the exact same as another person with that same disability, Mm -hmm. but then also not to assume that a disability isn't serious enough to start planning for Mm -hmm. the future. Right, yeah. And that is an interesting distinction of, uh, I think you use the term invisible disabilities. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's something that, you, you, I guess the definition would be something you can't visually see that's right. a little bit hidden. Yeah, um, because when you say, uh, when you say, okay, picture someone with a disability, like you said, you're drawn to like the parking lot and like, right. the, someone in a wheelchair. But there's lots of different types of disabilities out there. Some you can see and some you can't see, right? Yes, yeah. and the media is slowly catching up to introducing different types of uh, visuals of Mm -hmm. disability, but unfortunately, less than 2% of all characters on TV and television have a disability currently. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping as more people have and listen to discussions like this one Mm -hmm. and start to see people with disabilities in their own lives and in the media that the understanding about disability itself will change and improve. Sure, yeah. And along those lines, what would you, I guess, why should people care about their lawyer or financial advisor or professional understanding disability issues and aging? People have to care about that because if they don't, they're not, they're at risk of not receiving all of the services that they might need. Mm-hmm and all of the resources that they might might need. And so when you have a, an attorney who has no background in disability, hasn't gone through any training in assessing a client with a disability, like I mentioned before, they might ask the wrong questions. They might interpret the client's answer differently than how the client means, mm. which could completely change the path mm-hmm. for both legal and financial planning. Mm-hmm. 
expression can vary greatly between people with dif different disabilities. And so you want your lawyer to be able to identify your needs and to identify strategies to meet your wishes. And a lawyer who isn't educated on disability issues just can't do that for a person with a disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's really just thinking about kind of this aging process or, or someone with a disability, um, treating that a, a, as a person and that it's, uh, it's valuable to look at it with open eyes versus just treating mm -hmm. everyone kind of as a number and right. uh, everyone's going to follow the same exact process. No, we're all individuals and we have different individual needs that need to be met in different ways. And with the aging population especially, that's a population that tends to be ignored frequently mm -hmm. sure. by a lot of people, even in, in the service and other industries. Mm -hmm. But then you factor in that a lot of people who are aging also have disability, and that's also a population that's ignored. Sure. So you really have two major needs that aren't being met if the attorney or financial planner doesn't have a background in that. Right. Yeah, it's like a double whammy. Right. Yeah. Um, so can you give some examples of how you might adapt your methods or tools for a client with a disability or some things sure. you've done in the past? Yes. So in the past, I've adapted for clients with physical disabilities, things like mobility impairments, perhaps they have hand tremors or they don't have use of their hands as readily mm. as they used to, so they're unable to physically sign a document. So I've used things like signature stamps mm -hmm. where you get a literal stamp of that person's signature and they can use that to sign most legal documents. And they can also use that for a lot of financial purposes as well, uh, signing and endorsing checks and, and mm. promissory notes and the like. But I've also used different font sizes, different font colors when possible. Mm. People with visual impairments might have a difficulty reading and digesting cognitively words on a page if it's stark contrast, white background, dark black writing. Mm -hmm. Or they might have issues reading 12-point font, which 11, 12-point font sure. is, is the generic that most right. people use. And so I even encourage people to have, if they own a business, to have business cards that have larger fonts on it for people with visual impairments. So I've, I've made documents with larger font. I've changed the colors. I've... And I know that other attorneys here have done this, gone to see the client at a nursing home. Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable thing to do for a client that has a disability. You want to make sure that the writing utensil is easy for them to hold. So especially if they have a hand tremor or perhaps they can't clasp their hand closed normally, there mm -hmm. are different contraptions to either strap in a writing utensil or weight it down. Sure. You can also, and, and I've done this before for clients who are blind or have significant visual impairment, mm -hmm. if they want to sign a document, there are tiny cards, almost the size of a business card, and they have a cutout of a rectangular mm. rectangle where the signature is supposed to go. You put that cutout on the page that they're going to sign. Of course, they're cognitively understanding and sure. consenting to what they're signing. But you put that where on the page they need to sign. You put their hand to that. They feel where the signature is supposed to go, and they can sign. Mm -hmm. So it's just the little things. And like I said, every person with a disability is going to have a different need based on their disability and also personal preference. Mm -hmm. Some people might have the need, especially if they have a brain injury or Alzheimer's or dementia, to mm -hmm. take breaks mm -hmm. throughout a meeting. So maybe you don't do a, an hour meeting with them. You break it up into half hour, half hour, or whatever they need. Mm -hmm. So it's just being able to identify what their needs are, how their disability might affect them, listen to the client mm -hmm. when they are trying to tell you your need, their needs, and implement those to best serve them, because that's the most important thing. Sure. And uh, you've kind of touched upon this, but I think it's important to drive home. How, for maybe other professionals out there listening, uh, if someone is coming in with a disability, um, how do you identify that disability? Is that something that you as a professional should bring up? Is it part of a questionnaire? Is it more the responsibility of the person with the disability, especially if it's an invisible one? Um, a, how does it get identified, or how mm -hmm. should it be identified, maybe? A and then B, what steps would the person uh, 
a professional take to help them walk through that process? Sure. So first and foremost, follow the lead of the person okay. with a disability. If you mm -hmm. think they may have a disability or not, if they say, I would like this service, but I need it to be done this way, if possible, mm -hmm. Don't assume that they're just being picky. <laughs> they might just not feel comfortable disclosing their sure. disability to you. And mm -hmm. that's really important because a person has the right not to disclose their disability. Mm -hmm. But as a person providing any type of professional services to a person with a disability, if you're noticing things like they're asking a lot of questions, they, they don't seem to be understanding one specific paragraph in a brochure mm -hmm. or they're calling to make appointments, but they keep showing up at the wrong times or they keep canceling and having to reschedule. Try to think of alternate methods for meeting their needs and solving whatever problem there is. So mm -hmm. for example, if they're having an issue with that one paragraph of the brochure, break it down sentence by sentence with them. Maybe that can be done verbally, but for a person with a brain injury, that might need to be done in bullet points, mm -hmm. in shorter sentences. And the biggest tip that I have for a professional serving a person with a disability mm -hmm. is when you're asking questions about what they need and what they want, one short question at a time. Mm -hmm. This isn't because the person isn't capable of answering longer questions. It's because a lot of disabilities require one question to be answered at a time in a succinct way. Otherwise, the brain finds it overwhelming. Sure. Yeah. It's actually good tips for interviewing people on a radio show, too, yes. is try to ask <laughs> one question at a time, which sometimes I'm not guilty. Right. Or I'm guilty of. <laughs> um, and then just last, as we're wrapping up, uh, uh, what are some things uh, you've probably been recognized in the past? What have you done, kind of advocated in the past for people with disability? Well, I've advocated to Governor Gretchen Whitmer's office. I'm a big disability advocate online. I'm very active in that. And I provided trainings to police offices and lawyers' offices on disability issues. Yeah. Well, Ashley, uh, thank you so much for being part of the radio show. Thank you so much for being part of the team. Uh, with this added value that you provide, I think it's a wealth of value we're providing for our clients, those uh, suffering from disabilities or, or a loved one with disabilities. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much and make it a great week. Take care, everybody. Learn more about Chris Berry and how he can help your family by visiting online at thechrisberryshow.com. That's thechrisberryshow.com. You can also call Chris Berry at 810-355-2584. That's 810-355-2584. This program content reflects the opinions of Chris Berry and his guests, not the elder care firm Prosperity Capital Advisors or the Castle Wealth Group, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or as a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal or tax strategy. There is no guarantee that the strategist's statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There's no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs. This program is furnished by the Elder Care Firm.